friends, how's everybody doing? I never quite know when these videos actually start. It's just loading and loading and loading. No, I think we're good. Hey everybody, how's it going? Good evening, happy Friday. I uh, hope your guys' week was wonderful. Um, I'm not going to talk to you too much today. I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to start a story for you um, that was inspired by a lot of things really, but most of it was inspired by um, a call for submissions, like a lot of stories are for aspiring authors. Um, you know, a couple of the things I really enjoy are the Cthulhu mythos and the Arthurian mythos. So um, I saw this call and it was a mixture of the two and I thought it was a really awesome uh, combination, really awesome idea to do that. Uh, so I wrote this story called What Horror Excalibur Brings. The premise basically is uh, King Arthur removes the sword and the stone, and it happened to have been lodged in um, essentially Cthulhu's brain. And when he pulls the sword out, Cthulhu awakes, and uh, things go very, very poorly from there. So I'm going to go ahead. It is a three-part story. Uh, let me find what page it's on here. Uh, three-part story and Catching Lightning. Uh, so I will go ahead and read today the prologue and the first part. Starts here on page 200. Bear with me. Um, what horror Excalibur brings. Prologue. It began with Arthur and Excalibur. When he pulled the sword from the stone, he awakened an eldritch terror, all but forgotten by man, Cthulhu, the sleeper of Riley, the high priest of the great old ones. And with the great dread, all manner of horrors came slinking out from the shadows. The world had changed forever. Blight stretched across the land, engulfing everything good and just. Village by village, Avalon was swallowed by disease and decay, until little help remained among its people. The awakening was a slow awakening, as far as these things went, and revealed itself to Arthur and the knights of the round table intermittently at a great and terrible cost to their righteousness and nobility, not to mention their sanity. None more than Sir Percival, who took it upon himself to embark on a quest to stem the tides of the void. Sirs, he said to the demoralized knights of the round, and my wise king Arthur, allow me to journey to the Black Keep, a place we all agree grotesque and nightmarish occurrences abound. Tis not the only place, but tis the closest, and threatens the well-being of Camelot and all her inhabitants. Please, allow me to discover what can be done to return peace to our broken kingdom. Reluctant, they agreed, but no one offered to accompany Percival on his quest. "'Tis a fully, <clears throat> excuse me, "'Tis a quest most foolhardy, Sir Lancelot said. "'While noble, t'will only end in tragedy and death, I'm afraid,' Sir Galahad added. "'Ay, Lancelot, slumped in his chair. "'There is no returning from such a dark, wicked place.' "'King Arthur wheezed and waved his arm. "'The hardships of his short, cruel rule "'had shriveled him to a haggard, frail caricature "'of the man once worthy to wield Excalibur.' With red eyes and gray parched skin, he looked upon the chosen knights with apathy and disregard, a man defeated, withering away under the burden of failure. Percival bowed to his lord, though he was not sure the king recognized him. After many farewells and no tears shed, he took his leave of Camelot, and thus his story continues, or thus his story continued and ours began. Part 1. The Black Forest and the Glee Man Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. Uh, we're reading What Horror Excalibur Brings, and we are on part one, The Black Forest and the Glee Man. I will read uh, part two tomorrow, probably, and part three on Sunday, so thank you again for joining me. Part one, The Black Forest and the Glee Man. Percival rode north from Camelot like a man possessed of all pasts, presents, and futures, spurring his mare to her utmost limits. Day in, day out, he rode, and only stopped to drink from the river or one of its tributaries. Percival ate salted meat and dozed uneasily while saddled. On and on he went in this fashion until he arrived at the Black Forest's threshold. Whoa, girl. He reined his mare and tied her to a withered stump. She whinnied and kicked, tail pressed between her sweat-glistened haunches, and looked to Percival for reassurance. Percival patted her mane. Easy now. It's okay, girl. They are but trees, no matter how ghoulish they appear. Even from outside, Percival could tell the Black Forest was no ordinary forest, and these were no ordinary trees. 
Each had its own personality. Spirits of the dead resided within their very trunks. Perhaps they were buried in the dirt beneath his feet, arising in the, for in the form of oak and maple. They had grotesque, twisted faces. They leered, beckoned. They whispered foul secrets through the breeze in an alien tongue. Percival knelt beside the mare and scooped a fistful of dirt. He brought the soil to his nose and sniffed. It was not earthy, as expected, rather acrid, like hot rotten eggs and long, dead, forgotten things. He sifted the dirt with his fingers, allowing the finer grains to cascade back down to the ground. What remained was something dead indeed, or not quite dead by the way it squirmed. He crushed the creature in his strong palm and tossed it aside. For a while, he paced the threshold of the Black Forest. According to the archival maps, there should have been a wide, winding path through the trees, ranging from one side of the forest to the other. It would appear, he said to the man, that the path has overgrown. There is an unnatural, explosive growth to these before us. I am sorry, but I must leave you behind. The mare sneezed and looked at Percival with wet, tired eyes. Do not, do not reproach me. You know your way back to Camelot. There is nothing, be nothing beyond for you. Only tragedy and death, I am afraid, just as Sir Galahad warned. Now go, and pray we are, re we are reunited when my quest is done. Percival untethered the mare and smacked her rear. She took off without further delay. As one of his closest companions, Percival often forgot that she was a mere brute, a beast of burden, a tool to aid him on his crusades, nothing more. But then, why did he feel so sullen? The ghostly vis visages of the trees, the sinister whispers in the air, and the foul, decaying smell grew worse the deeper he trekked into the black forest. It was, if, it was as if the trees watched his every move, biding their time, until they would animate and strike him down. He had faced many a fearsome foe before, but none like this. Flesh and iron he understood, but sinister magics were his novelty. Percival heard the rustling of leaves among the undergrowth and the nearby clack-clack of mandibles. He felt a tightening, snake-like pressure around his boot. He kicked his leg and drew his dagger, ready to slay the offender, but it was a trick of his strained senses. One might lose himself in this forest. Many probably already had. Q the Gleeman. He appeared from behind a thicket of alder trees. While Percival's tarnished chainmail boots sunk and squelched in the increasingly moist soil, the bells fashioned to the Gleeman's visit garb jingled as he skipped unabated across the ground surface. I have never seen such an odd fellow, Percival said. His emerald tunic lay in tatters around his plump waist, and his brown leather trousers were torn in stripes down the leg, as if he had been mauled by a bear, or worse. Yet, despite all his apparent troubles, he beamed as one who had just wed a princess or one drunk off a cask of well-aged barley wine. On his head he wore a funny hat with golden feathers and shimmered in the On his head he wore a funny hat with golden feathers that shimmered in the scant moonlight. But it was the song he sang that gave Percival pause. And no, I'm not actually gonna sing it. You aren't that lucky tonight. Its gleeful tone did not match its foreboding message. There was a dissonance between melody and content that made Percival feel as if he might be sick. And the words, the awful, dreadful words, they had a serpentine quality to them that sent shivers down his spine. Through nights black and forest deep, miles to go before the keep, when you hear the rustling leaves, horrors one cannot conceive. Merrily I sing of thee, out of the void eyes to see, of whispers and hearkening, hail to thee awakening. We bow, arise, great old ones, outer gods beyond the sun. O oh, Cthulhu waits, streaming, teeth and tentacles seething. Azathoth, blighted ruler, none in the cosmos crueler. I arloth up, as man tending the great old one's plan. Of Yig I sing most loudly, and rhyme his name so proudly. He, the father of serpents, with none so bold a usurpant. Through autumn they cry, bum bum, to bay three tribes beat their drums. But to no avail they sound, their frights, their nightmares are found. Slithering shadow he comes, to venom guilty succumb. Upon completion of his third verse, the gleeman gave a sudden start. Ah, traveler, I did not see you there. What brings you to my neck of the woods? He blinked two sets of eyeballs and flashed a wide, nearly toothless grin. You are far from home and all alone in such a dark, dreary place. I am not alone, Percival said. You are with me plain as day. Besides, I am a knight of the round on a holy mission with God at my side. I am never alone. Not as long as I have faith. 
The gleeman cackled like a hyena and wagged the bales on, bells on his feet. What, I ask, is so funny, sir? A knight? In this forest? I certainly doubt as much. You talk of daylight and of God. Look around you. These parts have been twice abandoned by both entities you hold so dear. What is it you seek, good knight? For you will find neither day nor God here. Percival drew his sword and raised his shield high to the canopy. In the name of my lord King Arthur, I seek the Black Keep and its master. The gleeman snorted, and why would someone so pretty do such a foolish thing? The master there, whomever he may be, has brought a blight upon our land. I wish to cleanse this world of his foul presence, to set right the evils he so blatantly perpetrated. And you plan to do that with your... The gleeman's frown the gleeman, frowning, stopped and waved his hand in Percival's direction. With your little needle, I will do as I must and slay anything or anyone who dares try to stop me. The gleeman did not react to Percival's threat. The two men, one gallant in his chainmail armor, the other gay in brightly colored leathers, stood some distance apart. For a long moment, nothing but the forest silence passed between them. Then the gleeman flashed his familiar toothless grin. I daren't, good knight. Who am I to stand in the way of such a noble quest? But I must warn you, you are not the only one. You are not the only knight to tread these damp, forsaken grounds this eve. Oh, no, not the only one. Another? About the possibility of a knight's presence in these woods, you said you certainly doubted. I lied, the gleeman shrugged, and strummed a non-existent lute. A chord rang out in Percival's mind. You most wretched, insufferable, devious little sw- Ah, 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 the gleeman wagged the f his finger. The forest will hear you. Then, on patience, Percival stepped forward and raised his sword. It had been many a moon since his iron had tasted the blood of an enemy. As he moved for the killing blow, an unearthly wind picked up, rustling the leaves and a chorus of flutters around him, and pushing him backwards against his will. He strained against the invisible force with all his might, but he could not push through. Unaffected by the unholy gust, and untouched by Percival's blade, the gleeman began to dance and sing, Waiting, waiting, awaiting, in the darkness partaking. When the wind that was not wind stopped, Percival sheathed his sword. He had never faced defeat before, and he did not wish to face it twice in one night. The gleeman did not in the least seem bothered by Percival's attempt to slay him. He just danced and sang, My merry man, can you offer me no further guidance? You seem at ease in this forest, but everything else, including the trees themselves, <clears throat> is unnatural and eager to uproot and be gone from this place. Surely you must know something about the Black Keep. I know everything about the Black Keep. What would you like to know? Where can I find it? The gleeman sighed and sighed a mournful sigh. That's easy. It's everywhere and nowhere. It's you. It's me. It's the worms in the dirt and it's the owls in the tree. Who is its master? No response. Just a sudden flick of tongue and an elongated hiss. Fine. If you will not answer me that, can you at least tell me the precise location of the Black Keep's entrance? I wish to meet this unknowable lord and split him in twain. The gleeman wound his arms together as he pointed in a dozen different directions. He said, that way, and pointed towards the deepest, darkest part of the forest. No, no, wait. He scratched his chin and pointed in the same direction. That way. Percival looked to where the gleeman pointed and back to ask more questions. Already, the funny little man was skipping towards the edge of the forest, singing his funny little song. Down into his tomb you'll go, by the end you're sure to know, that your life is forfeited, of dreams you'll be acquitted and so on and so forth, until Percival could only hear the tune's incongruently bright tone. Then the gleeman was gone, but his bells rang long into the night. Part 2. The Lady and the Fallen Knight in the Tomb This forest is infinite, Percival said. I am a man trapped in a nightmare, but I will not wake until my quest is done. I cannot, for the sake of the kingdom and of its king. Perhaps the forest was infinite. He had been walking for what felt like days, and the scarce light from beyond the canopy had not changed. He squinted, searching for the sun or the moon, anything to tell him how long he had been walking. The trees still leered, but they no longer beckoned. They were simply silent, as was the wind, and swayed like hung skeletons. The black forest was a vacuum of light and time. Percival's thoughts, however, were far from silent. He was never a man to ponder. He acted. The notions swirling through his mind were maddening, drawing him to the brink of insanity, more so than the endless forest, more so than the constant phantom glingle-glingle of the glee man's bells. Camelot has fallen, 
The knights of the round have failed their kingdom. You have failed your kingdom. King Arthur is dead. Lancelot, Galahad, Gawain, Lionel, and the rest are dead. It is all your fault. You never should have left their company. You never should have been born. Just when he thought he was mad, a scream called out in the pitch, a maiden's cry for help, a language he well understood. Percival closed the portcullis of his mind and made haste towards the origin of the scream. It was not long before he came upon her, and she was not alone. Beneath the yew tree shone a halo of light. A knight in tarnished gold armor lay slain. His corpse was bloated and pink like a newborn, and like someone who had spent rather too long in the house of the Lady of the Lake. The skin of his face oozed through the slits of his helmet. Upon his shield were three crowns, like King Arthur's own, but they were not gold. They were black, blacker than black. He wore a black, lustrous, almost oily medallion with a similar symbol close to bursting around his neck. Percival slowed his pace and approached the unlikely scene with caution. Milady, he said, are you hurt? She was short of breath, her words curt and shrill. My good knight, I am unharmed, but my husband, oh, that foolish, foolish man. What hath conspired here? She burst into sobs and buried her face in her dirty, bloody palms. Her whole body heaved as she cried for the fallen man. She composed herself and said, it's too horrible to tell. Please, you must go away from here or suffer the same consequences. No man finds the Black Keep and lives, lives to tell of it. The Black Keep? Do you know where it is? I do not. I only know that my husband was on his way. I urged him to stop his silly quest. I begged him to come home to me and the children. I found him out here talking to a strange little man in emerald garb. They were singing. Did you hear what they were saying? She looked. She shook her head most furiously. Did you see anything at all? anything that might help me in my quest, for I too seek the Black Key. For the first time since leaving the company of the Gleeman, the wind stirred. It was as if everything came alive once again, seeking vengeance, and at this, at second chance of life. He shivered, and hovered his hand over the hilt of his sword. The medallion, she said, tis the key. To what, my lady? To the Black Key. Drum sounded from far away. Bum, 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 they sounded. Bum, 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 just like the beat of his heart. Percival stepped towards the maiden and placed his hand on her shoulder. He looked her in the eyes and found them black and shiny and infinitely deep. She blinked two sets of eyelids, just as the glee man had done, and averted her gaze. She mumbled something full of phlegm and oddly stressed syllables. What was that, my lady? She hissed and said, Do not seek the black keep. You will find only your doom. Percival had had enough of games and riddles and of telling her people telling him what he could and could not do. He shoved her aside and ripped the medallion clean off the knight's neck. It felt cold and slippery in his hand, and pulsed with his accelerated heart. The knight's corpse animated and rose from the earth in a blue swirl of leaves and dust. His eyes illuminated and wisps of smoke rose from them in his flaring nostrils. At full height, the fallen man was a head taller than Percival. The corpse levitated to the bow of the yew tree and exploded. A storm of black adders rained down on Percival and the maiden. The yew tree shivered and snakes fell from its branches in the hundreds. The maiden was caught in the same swirling blue. Her eyes lit and her body contorted like a puppet whose puppeteer was plagued with palsy. Percival rose his shield in time to deflect the snakes that exploded from her body. He stood stunned for a fraction of a moment as his world filled with hissing and scales. The beat of the drums drew nearer, louder, until it cut off completely, and he was able to regain his wits. He drew his sword. It glinted in the strange blue light. I have come too far, he cried, to succumb to your venom, beasts. He shrugged off a coil of adders that had latched themselves to his armor and brought his sword around in a single wide hacking motion. Dozens were cleaved in half and fell to the dirt, flailing until still and dead. One careful step at a time, he backed away from the writhing mass of snakes, hacking and stabbing and slashing wildly. Unable to pierce his staunch defense and land a killing blow, they fell in great numbers. As he killed them, the beating of the drums returned, louder with every cut, more intense with every stab, until he was left winded, standing knee-deep in a pile of slender, scaly carcasses. He was again alone with the irritating drum rhythm as it slammed against his temples. Percival waded out of the sea of snakes, threw down his sword, shield, and helmet, and dropped to his knees. 
He was out of breath and soaked in adder blood. High above him, through a crack in the canopy, he caught a glimpse of the full moon. It was bright, a beacon among the blackness of his journey thus far. It filled him with hope and renewed his battle-hardened spirits. Then a spark ignited in the sky and a single blue light streaked across the moon's path, disappearing among the greater cosmos. Its hue was ingrained in his memory for all eternity. The ground quaked. A fissure opened beside him, forcing him to either scramble away or be swallowed whole. A great tomb-like mon monolith, built out of the same lustrous black material as the medallion, rose from such, from some place deep underground. Upon its surface there was a door carved in a myriad of unimaginably horrible shapes. At first he could not imagine where the door might lead, but then it dawned on him. The Black Keep. Midway up the door, he noticed a circular depression where a key might fit. He approached, and the closer he got, the clearer he saw the space. Inside the circle, he found the outline of a crown that matched the medallion in his hand. He pressed the relic into the hole and twisted clockwise. Nothing happened. Then he tried to twist it the other way, counterclockwise, as everything else up until this point had been an upside down, had been so upside down. Another great rumbling came, and the door slid slowly open. A wall of smell, foul like decaying flesh, struck him full force, and he gagged. Whatever lay before him was of a nature unsuitable to man. Percival looked back but once, satisfied he was not being watched or followed. He entered the tomb. Ahead, destiny awaited. He sensed his desperate journey was finally coming to head, but there was more. There was the inescapable feeling of doom and demise creeping through his veins. And that is part two. Here we are, part three, the Black Keep and its Keeper. Percival, <clears throat> excuse me, Percival feared not the dark, damp passages behind that, behind that unlikely door. <laughs> I'm so excited about all this stuff today, I'm sort of, here, I gotta calm down a little bit. Percival feared not the dark, damp passages behind that unlikely door. Without a torch, and without the sun to guide him, he followed it down, 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 led by nothing but his finely honed intuition, or at least he thought he was moving down. It was a most disorienting descent, so he could not say for sure what was up, what was down, or even who he was anymore. No, it was not the darkness that frightened him, it was all the noises and the smells. Water drip dripping on stone from some unknown source, hushed whispers, a conversation happening from behind and in front of him wafting brimstone and settling must. Somewhere far away, the smell of smoldering coals and crisping meat tantalized his empty stomach, but he dared not imagine what kind of meat was cooking. No mortal animal could live so far underground. Percival took off his gloves and ran his bare fingers along the wet rocky walls. Cold yet strangely warming, he absorbed the wisdom of a thousand generations through the connection of flesh and mineral. It showed him worlds beyond the cosmos, beyond the ubiquitous, degenerating curse of time. He grew younger the deeper he delved. He began. He became, once again, a young man, newly knighted before King Arthur's court, a teenager living isolated among the trees and wolves with his mother, and a child growing up in the orchards of his family's countryside estate. They were all there, his father, his sister, his mother. They were gleeful and blessed, and there was no blight upon the land. Then the infernal drumming began anew. Bum, 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 bum. Louder and louder, faster and faster, until he could feel the vibrations of bone on sheepskin. The racket made him want to cover his ears and scream, to turn away and forget his thankless quest. But he could not stop, not after everything he had been through. Ahead, the passageway tightened and forced him to sidle and squeeze between wet, broken rock. At the end, it opened into a great chamber illuminated by a single light of unknown origin. It was the color of the spark in the sky. He stopped and found he could no longer move further into the chamber. His legs shook, rattling the links of his armor, and his lips quivered. Before him, in the vast, wicked chamber filled with stalagmites and stalactites, like sharp, crooked teeth, were innumerable horrors. First and foremost among them, the carcass of a massive, red-hued, bat-winged dragon, a beast he knew well. I'll probably butcher this name. I've only ever read this. It's one of those things, if you're a reader, um, a lot of the words you try to pronounce, um, you pronounce them because you've read them, not because you've heard them. Kilgara, Percival said. He recognized her from the castle dungeons. He had spoken to her once, despite Merlin's warning. She told him of ancient secrets before erasing his memory of everything she said. 
Had she warned him of this very moment? Had she known about the awakening, the blight, and everything else? If only he could remember her warning. If only Merlin had freed her earlier. One hundred red-cloaked figures stood around Kilgara. They chanted as they bowed to some unseen shadow from beyond. On a raised outcrop, a cluster of the red raindrops danced and played the drums. The origin, no doubt, of the damnable bum, 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 that had haunted Percival since he entered through the door. Nay, since he first encountered the maiden in the fallen night. On an alcove, on an alcove opposite, a massive bonfire raged. Upon it lay a spit fastened to stone and a metal skewer with a hunk of meat the size of a small cottage. Kilgara, he said again, and found tears were dripping down his cheeks. You did not deserve this fate, no matter your trickeries and deceit, no matter what the wizard had to say about you. You are aware you stand on the precipice of the Black Keep, are you not? The unexpected voice startled Percival. He jumped to the side and drew his sword in one fluid motion, only to find himself face to face with the Glee Man. Why did you follow me here? The Glee Man smiled from ear to ear and shook his head. I have always been here, good knight, and I will remain long after you have fallen and your corpse has been consumed by my master. I will not let you harm me. It is not I you should fear, it is Yig. For you have so wickedly wronged him, you have no idea of the pain and suffering you are to endure. I feel almost sorry for you, Percival. You dare speak my name? I speak whosoever's name I please. Enjoy it, for it will be the last time you hear the words spoken. The only force holding Percival back from cleaving the Glee Man and Twain was a memory. Not too long ago, he had tried the same, and had been thwarted by powers undeniably stronger than himself. He could not kill the funny little man, whether he wanted to or not. But he could be angry. There was justice and anger. Why are you here, then? Simply to mock me? I want to be the first to sing about your demise, Percival. To tell the tale of your failure, I must see it for myself. You understand, I'm sure. Legends should not be told by uninterested parties. The drums stopped, and the fire beneath the hunk of meat ceased, leaving smoldering coals, and the red-cloaked figures dropped to their hands and knees like puddles. The glee man let out a maniacal, breathy laugh. He backed away into the shadows and said, Ha ha! He comes! Or he's come! Good luck, though fortune tread not here. His voice was distant, hollow, and snake-like. You're going to die tonight, knight. So much for saving your precious kingdom. Ha 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 ha! Sword in hand, shield raised, Percival dropped into the chamber. There was no sense in further delaying the inevitable. This was, after all, what he came here to do. The cloaked figures did not move as he approached them. Fearing what, what might happen if disturbed, he maneuvered carefully through the throng, winding his way to the far side. A series of growls and hisses from where the unseen shadow awaited turned his nerves to jam, but he kept true to the task at hand. When he came around the last corner, the shadow materialized into the form of a half-man, half-serpent monstrosity that rose to nearly double Percival's height. The beast had a crescent carved upon its head and thick layered scales along its slender body. It stood on narrow yet staunch legs and flicked a black forked tongue the size of a lance between bared fangs. Percival stood tall to match Yig, but he had never felt smaller in his life. This was the father of serpents, the foul beast who had wrought such blight upon the land. This was Percival's destiny. You, Yig boomed. You, Percival said. They stared each other down for a long moment, and it seemed the entire cosmos orbited around them. Far away, the glee man sang. Through autumn they sound bum bum, to bay three tribes beat their drums, but to no avail they sound, their frights, their nightmares are found. Slithering shadow he comes, to venom guilty succumb. Yig dropped to its belly and slithered around Percival, entrapping him between the mercy of its slender coiled body. Now, face to face, the, beats, the beast spoke. You call yourself a fair and noble knight. Yet you murdered my children in cold blood. They fell to the sting of your awful blade, a blade with no name nonetheless. They were innocent creatures, wretched what fury you, your wrath brought upon them. Tell me, knight, what excuses you from the commandments of God? They came at me. Silence! Yig hissed. No such thing occurred. You trespassed on these, our hollowed grounds. You came into our home without welcome. You cleansed your fears with their blood. You good night came upon them. The entire chamber shuddered under the weight of Yig's accusation. Percival almost found himself rocked off his feet, but managed to keep his balance on the tip of his shield. He clapped his sword on its surface three times. 
And now I come upon you, Snake, to draw your blood and add it to the river of your children. Yig struck first, coming at Percival's jowls open with pre pre preternatural speed. Percival swiped the blow aside with his shield and sliced downward with his sword. It would have been a killing blow. But Yig wrapped its tail around the knight's ankles and tore them from beneath him. Pathetic, you humans are so predictable. Percival grunted and rolled away from another fast strike. Yig's fangs cracked on the damp, rock-strewn chamber floor. It hissed in pain and pulled away, clutching its leathery hands to its bleeding face. Percival did not hesitate. He leaped towards the beast, shield forward, and sword cocked back. He seemed to hang there, suspended in time, as Yig cowered before him. Then everything sped up, and Percival fell, blade first, upon the snake god. He struck true, and his sword buried itself to the hilt in Yig's side. In turn, Yig slithered some ways away, taking the sword with it, and coddled the fresh wound. The red cloaks, cloaked figure's chanting began anew, and a hail of stone and arrows rained upon the battlefield. Before he could defend himself, a heavy stone struck Percival in the temple, another below his left eye. One of the crude arrows lodged itself in his right thigh, its devilishly sharpened tip splitting clean through to the other side. He cried out, but did not falter. Shield held perpendicular above his head to deflect the projectiles. He zigzagged to close the space between them. Yig was not prepared to defend another attack. It was busy trying and failing to remove the blade. It looked up as Percival's shield collided with its chin. Percival let the shield go, go rolled across its surface, and removed the sword smoothly from its place. He slid down the length of Yig's body and tail, allowing his momentum and the sharpness of his blade to split the beast from neck to navel. Yig hissed once more and flopped onto the ground, writhing until dead. The hail of stones and arrows stopped. So did the horrific sound of the red-cloaked red -cloaked figure's collective voices. Percival stood, triumphant, chest and shoulders heaving after the exertion of the battle. Clapping erupted, seemingly from every direction. The glee man stepped out from the shadows. Bravo, bravo. Quite a show, my good knight. Quite a show indeed. Percival merely growled. I most thoroughly appreciated the moment when you leaped from certain death to... Percival howled, his voice booming throughout the entire chamber and spun, sword arm locked tight, his blade cut cleanly, relieving the glee man of his head, silencing his song. He removed Yig's head in a similar fashion, trophies to present to King Arthur. Limping, he left the Black Keep and the cursed Black Forest behind him forever. The cloaked figure stepped aside and allowed him safe passage. After all, there was nothing left for them to worship. Epilogue. The knights of the round were merry indeed. They drank mead and danced and sang long into the night. To Percival, to Percival, they cheered. To the king! King Arthur sat upon his throne, fat and jolly, filled with renewed vim and vigor and appreciation for his knights and their dedication to the kingdom. Most of all, he was appreciative of Percival, who never gave in to the blight's morose effects. He who never wavered in courage or righteousness. Percival stood aside from the festivities, however. Since his return to the castle, life had not been the same. He was plagued with night terrors and tremors. He could not help hearing snakes everywhere he went. No matter how much mead he drank or how many maidens he laid with, he could not escape the infernal hissing and drumming of that terrible place. And his mare had never returned. This knowledge hurt him the most. But these were his burdens to carry, and his alone. He saved Camelot, perhaps the entire realm, and these were but small prices to pay. Given a second chance, he would gladly pay, pay them again. Aye, Percival, Lancelot called, said. Come join us, you beautiful buffoon. Percival forced a smile and nodded. He flicked his tongue and tasted mead on the air. It sent a shiver of desire down his spine. Before joining the other knights, an itch came upon him, and he scratched his neck, peeling off scaly skin. He examined the scales, rubbing them between his fingers, and flicked them away. There was merriment to partake, and he was not about to allow a patch of dry skin to ruin this, a celebration in his honor. He hummed a song on his way to join the others. Slithering shadow he comes, to venom guilty succumb. The end. That is the end of the horror Excalibur brings.